My name is Jarvis. Uh, pleased to meet you. Thanks for coming here today. Uh, we're going to, as you can see, the title of the talk is up there: extraordinary. Mm. And uh, I don't know. I, I, last time I was in Austin was about um, five years ago. I did I did a talk about lyrics. Some of you may have seen it. I don't know. Um, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's going to be exactly the same. So you may as well go out. No, joking, <laughs> joking. That kind of set off a chain of events in a way, um, and it all culminated in me uh, publishing a book of lyrics. This isn't an adver advertisement. This book is not available downstairs, okay? So I'm not trying to sell you anything. Uh, in that talk that I did before, I was talking about what I, how I thought lyrics worked, how they worked in music, stuff like that. In this talk, uh, I'm going to read you some of my own work, and I'm hoping, in the process of doing that, I can pass on some of my tricks or my beliefs about songwriting. I have to stress that they're my beliefs, so they're not forced to work for everybody, but who knows? They might do. So one of my main contentions in this is that uh, instead of straining your eyes looking for uh, inspiration coming over the horizon, some distant place, you'd be much better served by actually looking in the immediate vicinity, the, the stuff that surrounds you every day on a daily basis, uh, the stuff that you often overlook because after all, look, it's here, I'm not looking at it, I'm looking in the distance, I'm not looking at the floor, that's why it's occasionally I may trip up. Um, and this is something that I tried to, I, I, when the book came out I went to my old school to uh, speak about it. That didn't go so well actually, to be honest. Because uh, I, I did like a long talk, and then at, at the end, all I got asked was, have you ever met Simon Cowell? <laughs> um, again, because it's like the way it works on the X Factor, is like, you know, you get take, somebody takes you under their wing, and they, they get a choreographer to sort your moves out, and they sort, you know, sort your clothes out, and all this thing, like, as if there's some way of making you into it. Well, artistic success wouldn't be the... The word for X Factor, I suppose, but there's some, there's, there's a formula, as if there's a formula, and it's passed on from other people. I don't believe that. So I tried to convince the kids. Uh, I really don't know if I managed to do that, but uh, I read them some stuff, and that's what I'm going to try and do a bit today. Try and uh, show you how my writing process evolved. And uh, the first one, we're talking about looking at the mundane, we're talking about looking at the everyday. Is there anything more mundane and everyday than a bus journey? No, Jarvis, there isn't. Right, okay. <laughs> so, I'm going to swap over to this other microphone now to read you uh, the lyrics to a song called Inside Susan. Susan catches the bus into town at 10.30 a.m. and sits on the back seat. She looks at the man in front's head and thinks how his fat, wrinkled neck looks like a large carrot sticking out from the collar of his shirt. She adds up the numbers on a bus ticket to see if they make 21, but they don't. Maybe she shouldn't bother going to school at all then. Her friends will be in the yard with their arms folded on their chests, pushing up their breasts to try and make them look bigger, while the boys will be too busy playing football to notice. The bus is waiting on the high street when it suddenly begins to rain torrentially and it sounds like someone has emptied about a million packets of dried peas onto the roof of the bus. What if it just keeps raining, she thinks to herself, and it was just like being in an aquarium, except it was all shoppers and office workers that were floating past the windows instead of fish. She's still thinking about this as the bus goes past Caroline Lee's house, where there was a party last week. There were some German exchange students over who were very immature. They ended up jumping out of the bedroom window. One of them tried to get her to kiss him on the stairs, so she kicked him. Later, she was sick because she'd drunk too much cider. Caroline was drunk as well. She was pretending that she was married to a tall boy in glasses, and she had to wear a polo neck for three days afterwards to cover up the love bite on her neck. By now, the bus is going past the markets. Outside is a man who spends all day forcing felt-tipped pens into people's hands and then trying to make them pay for them. She used to work in a pet shop there, 
but she got sacked for talking to boys when she was supposed to be working. She wasn't too bothered, though. She hated the smell of the rabbits anyway. Maybe this bus won't stop, she thinks, and I'll stay on it until I'm old enough to go into pubs on my own, and it'll drive me to a town where people with black hair are treated specially, and I can make lots of money from charging fat old men five pounds a time to look up my skirt, and they'll be queuing up to take me out to dinner. I suppose you think she's just a silly girl with stupid ideas, but I remember her in those days. They talk about people with a fire within and all that stuff. Well, she had that all right. It's just that nobody dared to jump into her fire and risk being consumed. Instead, they put her in a corner and let her heat up the room, warming their hands and backsides in front of her and then slagging her off around town. No one ever really got inside Susan and she always ended up getting off the bus at the terminus and then walking home. Thank you. So that was the start, you know, that's like based on observations at school. So my particular journey, uh, I formed the group at school. We first concerts were at school. Then it came to the end of school. Uh, I decided that I was going to be a superstar and all the other people in the band, their parents didn't agree. And so they all went off to university. I stayed in Sheffield. And this next one that I'm going to read you um, uh, is basically about that process. I, I stayed in Sheffield, tried to make it with the band. It didn't really happen. And it, it gradually dawned on me I, I was going to have to move or do something different if, uh, if that fame was ever going to uh, occur. So this is a song called uh, David's Last Summer, which is on the record His and Hers. We made our way slowly down the path that led to the stream, swaying slightly, drunk on the sun, I suppose. It was a real summer's day, the air humming with heat, whilst the trees beckoned us into their cool green shade. And when we reached the stream, I put a bottle of cider into the water to chill, both of us knowing that we'd drink it long before it had chance. This is where you want to be. There's nothing else but you and her and how you spend your time. Walking to parties whilst it's still light outside. Peter was upset at first, but now he's in the garden talking to somebody Polish. Why don't we set up a tent and spend the night out there and we could pretend that we're somewhere foreign, but we'll still be able to use the fridge if we get hungry or too hot. This is where you want to be. There's nothing else but you and her and how you use your time. The room smells faintly of suntan lotion in the evening sunlight. And when you take off your clothes, you're still wearing a small, pale skin bikini. The sound of children playing in the park comes from far away, and time slows down to the speed of the specks of dust floating in the light from the window. Summer leaves fall from summer trees, summer grazes fade on summer knees, summer nights are slowly getting long, summer's going, so hurry. Soon it'll be gone. So we went out to the park at midnight one last time, past the abandoned glass house stuffed full of dying palms, past the bandstand and down to the boating lake. And we swam in the moonlight for what seemed like hours until we couldn't swim anymore. And as we came out of the water, we both sensed a certain movement in the air and we both shivered slightly and ran to collect our clothes. And as we walked home, we could hear the leaves curling and turning brown on the trees, and the birds deciding where to go to for the winter, and the whole sound of summer packing its bags and preparing to leave town. Oh, but I want you to stay. Oh, please stay for a while. I don't want to live in the cold. Thank you. Uh, so that's where we, what I'm trying to get is that the life becomes the, uh, the stuff that you produce. We're going to take a, a very short musical interlude because I think if you just have to listen to me droning on for an hour, it's going to, you may actually fall asleep. Uh, and I wouldn't blame you. So uh, let's have a listen now. This is a piece of music um, 
by the person with the glasses. See him? He's a poet called Roger McGough. That's him uh, back in the 60s in a group called The Scaffold, who unfortunately are kind of remembered mainly for uh, novelty songs like, we'll drink a drink a drink to Lily the Pink, the Pink, the Pink. Uh, you know that one? Did that, did that cross over the Atlantic? I, I apologize. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, on some scaffold records, he did read some of his poetry with a musical background, and that was kind of an early influence on me. So I'm just going to play you a short extract from uh, one of those, which is called Summer with Monica. They say the sun shone now and again, but it was generally cloudy with far too much rain. They say the greatest train robbery in history took place. Probably students. Who else wants to steal a train? <laughs> they say cabinet ministers and osteopaths were particularly vulgar around this time. They say babies were born. Married couples made love, often with each other. And people died, sometimes violently. They say it was an average ordinary, moderate run of the mill, common or garden summer. But it wasn't. For I locked a yellow door And I threw away the key And I spent summer with Monica And Monica spent summer with me Unlike everybody else We made friends with the weather Most days the sun called And sprawled all over the place Or the wind blew in As breezily as ever And ran its fingers through our hair But usually it was the moon That kept us company some days we thought about the seaside and built sandcastles on the blankets and paddled in the pillows or swam in the sink and played with shoals of dishes. Other days we went for long walks around the table and picnicked on the banks of the settee or just some bathed lazily in front of the fire until the shilling set on the horizon. We danced a lot that summer. Bossin overed by the bookcase or Madison's instead. Hully gullied by the oven or did the twist in bed. At first we kept birds in a transistor box to sing for us. But sadly they died, we being too embraced in each other to feed them. But it didn't really matter. Because we made love songs with our bodies, I became the words and she put me to music. They say it was just like any other summer, but it wasn't. For we had love and each other and the moon for company when I spent summer with Monica, and Monica spent summer with me. That was Roger McGough there. Um, so let's pick up my story again. So I had to leave Sheffield and went to London. Big city, you know, try and make something of yourself. So what was the first thing I decided to do was get heavily in, into the acid house movement, <laughs> which was going on in the late 80s in uh, the UK. So a few years later, that came out as a song called Sorted for Ease and Whiz, which is based on a girl I met who'd been to the Stone Roses Spike Island concert. And I said, oh, what was it like? You know, legendary concert, legendary concert. And she said, well, there were just all these guys walking around going, y'all sorted for ease and whiz. <laughs> so the phrase stuck in my head and, and became this song. Uh, have a look at the screen. We've got moving images for this one, uh, courtesy of the artist Mark Leckie. Uh, it's a film of his called Fiorucci Made Me Hark, or uh, some good dancing in this. Is this the way they say the future's meant to feel, or just 20,000 people standing in a field? And I don't quite understand just what this feeling is, but that's okay, because we're all sorted out for ease and whiz. And tell me when the spaceship lands, because all this has just got to mean something. In the middle of the night, it feels all right, but then tomorrow morning, then you come down. Oh yeah, the pirate radio told us what was going down. We got the tickets from some fucked up bloke in Camden Town, and no one seems to know exactly where it is, but that's okay, because we're all sorted out for ease and whiz. At four o'clock, the normal world seems very, very, very far away. In the middle of the night, it feels all right. But then tomorrow morning, oh, then you come down. Just keep on moving. Everybody asks your name. They say, we're all the same. And now it's, nice one, geezer. 
That's as far as the conversation went. I lost my friends, I dance alone, it's six o'clock. I wanna go home, but it's no way, not today. Makes you wonder what it meant. And this hollow feeling grows and grows and grows and grows and you want to call your mother and say, mother, I can never come home again because I seem to have left an important part of my brain somewhere in a field in Hampshire. All right, in the middle of the night, it feels all right, but then tomorrow morning, oh, then you come down. Oh, then you come down. What if you never come down? Well, I did come down. <laughs> uh, but yeah, once in London, uh, kind of got in, you know, you have to get into, um, I don't know, how to, the sex, I guess, yeah. <laughs> so I'd like to read one now about um, sex in the afternoon. I always think of London when I, this one, this is called acrylic afternoons. Acrylic uh, is a fiber, as you know. Uh, it's a bit like wool, but it isn't. Synthetic type. That's what I'm thinking of, not like acrylic paint or anything like that. I fell asleep on your sofa and I had a dream about a small child in dungarees who caught his hands in the doors of the Paris Metro. This is the safety signage, you know, for um, the Paris Metro, still in use. Don't know why they chose a rabbit. I, I had to change it from a rabbit to a child because that was too silly. Um, <laughs> then my face cracked open and you were there. You were there dressed in green, saying something obscene, but that's why I came here in the first place. Well, that and the tea. Can I stay here, lying under the table together with you? Can I hold you forever in acrylic afternoons? I want to hold you tight whilst children play outside and they wait for their mothers to finish with lovers and call them inside for the tea. Cushions and TV and the table set for tea, one for you, one for me. Come and lie down on the settee. In that green jumper, you can have anything you want. And the clock is saying that it's half past four, but you know, I want to stay a little more. I want to stay a little more. Can I stay here, lying under the table together with you now? Can I hold you forever in acrylic afternoons? I want to hold you tight whilst children play outside and they wait for the mothers to finish with lovers and call them inside for the tea. On a pink quilted eider down, I want to pull your knickers down. Neck curtains blow slightly in the breeze. Lemonade light filters through the trees. It's so soft and it's warm. Just another cup of tea, please. One lump, yeah, thank you. Can I stay here, lying under the table together with you? Can I hold you forever in acrylic afternoons? I want to hold you tight whilst children play outside and wait for the mothers to finish with lovers and call them inside for the tea. Oh, Wayne, Julie, Diane, Kevin, Shane, Heather, Rachel, Chelsea, Leanne, come home, your mum misses you. <laughs> well, of course, all that kind of shenanigans is only get, gonna get you to one place. Um, marriage. Uh, and I almost got married, but it didn't happen. But in the, in the, in the run up for that, I, uh, I tended to imagine some modern um, marriage vows. This is a song that never really got released, but I'll, uh, I'll do it for you now. Imagine we're in a, it's good, slightly, this is a bit like a pulpit, isn't it? So imagine, dearly beloved, thank you. <laughs> right, so I'm in church, solemn. I promise not to rip you off. And I promise not to sell you out. I will never smoke all your stash if I happen to find it whilst tidying up. <laughs> Which, let's face it, isn't likely. <laughs> well, I would always leave you at least a joint's worth anyway. <laughs> and I will never eat the last bit of cereal and then put the empty packet back hoping you won't notice. Or if I do, I'll pay for the next lot, I promise, because I know that really gets on your nerves. <laughs> and I will never sleep with any of your friends. Well, not your best friends. <laughs> I don't know just what I'm meant to do. I don't want to make it wrong for you. How can we escape what's happened to all those others who've gone before us two? Baby, we have lived together. Now we'll do it all forever. Hold my hand. Don't ever let it go. Close your eyes. Hold tight. 
and here we go. And how do we avoid being like all oh, those other cheese masters, demonstrating the facilities of their new car and the trouser press? From hunter-gatherer to washer-dryer is a long, strange trip. And what if our kids turn into pudgy blobs wearing Union Jack underpants, addicted to coffee whitener? Bloated caricatures of something vaguely recognizable as a human being, a human being that you once loved. I don't know just what I'm meant to do. I don't want to make it wrong for you. How can we escape what's happened to all those others who've gone before us too? Baby, we have lived together. Now we'll do it all forever. Hold my hand, don't ever let it go. Close your eyes, hold tight, and here we go. So this is it. We are walking down the aisle. The dawning of a new era. Is this the start of a new airbrushed Disney life? Or some 36-part depressing as hell northern drama to be repeated every night for the rest of our lives? <laughs> oh, and now I'm frightened. Oh yeah, I am shitting Barrett houses here. <laughs> Is this the right thing? And then suddenly I'm turning to look at your face and I'm saying, I do, I do, I do. I do. Okay, we'll have another little musical break here. It's well known uh, that I'm a big fan of Scott Walker and he certainly opened my eyes. Yeah, come on, give it up. <laughs> we should, let's give it up for Scott. Um, and um, he, he first opened my eyes uh, to this thing of of really writing about ordinary things, but in some way dramatizing it with the musical arrangements behind the music. And um, we ended, Pulp ended up working with him. Uh, I, I won't, I'll get to that in a bit. Let's just listen to an excerpt from a song of his called The Amorous Humphrey Plug. Mr. Big Shot Say you're looking smart I've had a tiring day I took the kids along to the park You've become a stranger Every night with a boy Got a new suit That old smile's come back And I kiss The children goodnight And I slip Away on the newly wax floor I've become a giant I fill every street I dwarf the rooftops, I hunch back the moon, stars dance at my feet, leave it all behind me, screaming kids on my knee and the telly, swallowing Have to stop it there. There we are. And look at that dog. Um, 
So, as I say, we have many years later, uh, Pulp ended up um, doing an album with Scott Walker, who produced the last Pulp record, uh, Wheel of Life, and that was intimidating, to say the least. But I think that is one thing, you know, as we were saying before, this idea of looking at these artists you admire as the super beings, um, and th as if they're a different species to you, is not helpful when you're trying to write stuff yourself. And so being in the studio with somebody is probably a good way of uh, getting over that, you know. When you're discussing, you know, if you, you can't really be making a record and go, just say, yes, my liege, uh, should you want more reverb on that? Yes, that's a good idea, yes, yes, sire. Uh, you can't do that, you can't make a record that way. Uh, that said, the record didn't do very well, so maybe we should have done that, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I want to read you one of the, uh, the lyrics to one of the songs on that record. And this is about, so you go, you leave your hometown, you go to London or whichever city, you try and get something together, you have a go, and then at one point, you start thinking, oh, I wonder what it would be like to go back. I wonder if all those places are still there. Um, and this is a, a song that kind of deals in that a little bit. Um, here we go. Just behind the station, before you reach the traffic island, a river runs through a concrete channel. I took you there once. I think it was after the lead mill. The water was dirty and it smelt of industrialization. Little mesters coughing their lungs up and globules the color of tomato ketchup. But it flows. Yeah, it flows. Underneath the city, through dirty brickwork conduits connecting white witches on the moor with pre-Raphaelites down in Broom Hall, beneath the old tree bore factory that burned down in the early 70s, leaving an antiquated sweet shop smell and caverns of nougat and caramel. Mmm, nougat, nougat and caramel. And the river flows on. Yeah, the river flows on beneath, oh, you've heard these guys before, pudgy 15-year-olds addicted to coffee wine now. Courting couples naked on northern upholstery and pensioners gathering dust like bowls of plastic tulips. And it finally comes above ground again at Forge Dam, the place where we first met. I went there again for old time's sake, hoping to find the child's toy horse ride that played such a ridiculously tragic tune. It was still there, but none of the kids seemed interested in riding on it. And the cafe was still there too, the same press-in plastic letters on the price list and scuffed for mica top tables. I sat as close as possible to the seat where I'd met you that autumn afternoon. And then after what seemed like hours of thinking about it, I finally took your face in my hands and I kissed you for the first time. And a feeling like electricity flowed through my whole body. And I immediately knew I'd entered a completely different world. And all the time, in the background, the sound of that ridiculously heartbreaking child's ride outside. At the other end of town, the river flows underneath an old railway viaduct. I went there with you once, except you were somebody else. And we gazed down at the sludgy brown surface of the water together. Then a passerby told us that it used to be a local custom to jump off the viaduct into the river when coming home from the pub on a Saturday night. But that this custom had died out when someone jumped and landed too near to the riverbank and had sunk in the mud there and drowned before anyone could reach them. Maybe he just made the whole story up, but you'd never get me to jump off that bridge. No chance. Never in a million years. Yes, a river flows underneath this city. I'd like to go there with you now, my pretty, and follow it on for miles and miles below other people's ordinary lives, occasionally catching a glimpse of the moon through manhole covers along the route. Yeah, it's dark sometimes, but if you hold my hand, I think I know the way. This is as far as we got last time, but if we go just another mile, we will surface surrounded by grass and trees and the flyover that takes the cars to cities. Buds that explode at the slightest touch, nettles that sting, but not too much. I've never been past this point. What lies ahead, I really could not say. And I used to live just by the river in a disused factory just off the wicker and the river flowed by day after day, and one day, I thought, one day I will follow it. But that day never came. I moved away and lost track. But tonight, I'm thinking about making my way back. 
I may find you there and float on wherever the river may take me. Wherever the river may take me, wherever the river may take us, wherever it wants us to go, wherever it wants us to go. Thanks. Okay, and come in, just got one more to read you before we get on to the, uh, I've not forgotten about the flying, don't worry. Okay, so, uh, so what happens then? You think about going back. There always comes, I think, a stage in anyone's life when you start to consider an alter ego. You think about the things that you haven't done in your life. If we get young in about it, you know, you, you always have to embrace the other and develop the other to try and get some kind of balance. So enter the story, Darren. Darren is my alter ego, uh, Darren Spooner. He, uh, I invented Darren, and Darren helps me, and helps me to express sides of my character which I wouldn't be happy about showing in public otherwise. As you can see, Darren isn't quite alive. Darren is frightening. I can sense a chill in this room now. <laughs> You're shitting yourselves. <laughs> Sorry, crude, <laughs> crude. Anyway, to give you a little bit of, uh, I say this is the last reading I'm gonna do, uh, then we get onto the self-help bit. <laughs> don't, honestly, don't, don't get too worried. Uh, but uh, this, to give you a bit more of an insight into Darren, this is a piece I wrote for the Time Out Listings magazine in London about uh, just over 10 years ago. They asked for, uh, it was something, you know, for their Christmas issue. I, I'm sure they were slightly flabbergasted by what they got, but uh, this is called Darren's Dream. Remember, this is Darren's Dream, not mine. Oh, no. <laughs> not mine. It was night time, and I was outside on a country road. There were hundreds of toads trying to cross the road to get to their mating pond, but they were moving too slowly and were getting squashed by passing juggernauts. I wanted to pick them up and carry them across the road to the pond, but I didn't have anything to put them in, and I don't, li I don't like touching things that are slimy. Suddenly, I was standing on some cellar steps with a bad stomachache. There was an awful taste in my mouth. I realized that I had, I had swallowed the toads in order to transport them. I began heaving and eventually sicked up a large toad covered in thick mucus, then another then another. After a while, a door opened at the top of the cellar steps and someone shouted down my name. Barry White was due on stage in 10 minutes and I hadn't ironed his shirt yet. <laughs> I ran up the stairs and I was in the kitchen area of the Park and Arbathorn Working Men's Club. An ironing board was set up near the cooker with Barry's shirt on it, but I couldn't plug the iron in because it had a European plug on it and the PowerPoint was English. Jane Seymour walked into the room. She's on the right. <laughs> it's, Darren, it's Darren's dream. Um, Jane Seymour walked into the room wearing the same outfit as in Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger. She put her arms around my shoulders and tried to kiss me. I said I had to finish the shirt. How do you think I got my hair so straight, she said. She took the plug of the iron and put it in her mouth. Then she bent over the ironing board and began ironing the shirt. I took her from behind as she was doing this, and the iron let out a cloud of steam. <laughs> Soon it was like a sauna. Her skin was smooth and covered in beads of sweat. I felt I was about to come. I closed my eyes in order to savor the moment. In my ear, I heard the words, is everybody in? Is everybody in? I opened my eyes and I was sat around a campfire with some Red Indians. Jim Morrison was dancing and singing with a bottle of Newcastle Brown in his hand, <laughs> which he kept swigging from. He had a long beard and was very overweight. He was wearing a flowery shirt and tracksuit bottoms. The smoke from the fire was burning my eyes. I looked down and saw I still had a hard on. None of the Indians had noticed. They were arguing about whether to allow a monster truck rally that was scheduled to take place on their land the next day to go ahead. Jim began to sing, I believe I can fly. <laughs> the Indians took no notice. 
I was appalled because he was getting all the words wrong. <laughs> a shot rang out. Jim fell onto the fire and was immediately engulfed in flames. He burnt blue like when you put rum on a Christmas pudding. I guess that's all the alcohol, I thought. <laughs> Charles Bronson approached the campfire, his rifle still smoking. He was dressed like in Chato's Land, my favorite film. He offered me some chips. They're cooked in dog fat, he said. I took one to be polite. The toad taste came back into my mouth and I had to spit. It landed on one of Bronson's moccasins. The Indians went crazy and dragged me to my feet. Bronson was laughing. They dragged me over to a large wooden pole stuck into the ground. Eva Herzegova was already tied to it, wearing her bra and pants like in those adverts from a few years ago. They tied me up so that my body was against hers face to face. Save me, save me, she whispered. Her breath was hot on my cheek. I wanted to do it to her, but I was tied so tight I couldn't move. I knew that in a few seconds we were going to be burnt at the stake. All I could do was rub myself against her a bit. <laughs> As I rubbed, she kept whispering, save me, save me. And the pole began to grow out of the ground, going higher and higher and higher. The flames will never reach us here, she said, and we started kissing. Suddenly, there was the sound of a gunshot, and her body went limp. Bronson was shooting from below. The same shot that had killed her had broken the ropes holding me. I moved round to the other side of the pole and began shinning up it. At the top of the pole was a trapdoor. I pushed it open and climbed through. I found myself in a Shaolin temple just like the one at the end of Enter the Dragon. Bruce Lee was sitting on the floor crying. I asked him what was wrong. He told me that his manager had signed a sponsorship deal with Gap. <laughs> and now he had to wear cargo pants whenever he fought. <laughs> Plus, he was signed up to do a tour of British holiday camps during the summer, demonstrating his martial arts skills. I saw that he was indeed wearing cargo pants, although they were black instead of the usual khaki color. I told him from a distance no one would be able to tell. <laughs> this seemed to enrage him, and he jumped up into a fighting pose. I said I didn't want to fight because he was one of my heroes, but he wouldn't back off. He kept doing flying kicks to my face, but I wouldn't fight back. My nose started bleeding, and when I looked down, there was a Yorkshire Terrier <laughs> licking up the pool of blood that had collected at my feet. I kicked at it to shoo it away, and it sunk its teeth into my foot. It didn't really hurt. It was just like little pins sticking in me, but it was irritating. <laughs> I tried to shake him off, but he wouldn't let go. I, I kicked him against the wall, but he still would not let go. I realized that I was going to have to beat the dog to death to get it off my foot. <laughs> I didn't want to do this because I'm an animal lover, and so I started to cry. Then I heard Bruce Lee laughing at me, and I lost my temper. I gave him a roundhouse kick to the head. He fell to the floor, and when he got up, the Yorkshire Terrier was attached to his face. It seemed to be eating his cheek. He screamed and jumped through one of those paper screens that they always have in kung fu films. <laughs> I looked at my watch and saw that it was half past 11. Shit. I suddenly remembered that we were supposed to be playing a concert, and we were due on stage at 11.15. I was late. I pushed open the temple doors, and I could hear music coming from up a staircase. I ran up the stairs and I was under the stage. The stage was see-through and I could see the rest of the band playing without me. I banged on the stage, but they couldn't hear me because they always play so bloody loud. <laughs> it was a little bit like the, when the kid's under the ice in The Omen. They finished the song and I managed to attract Jason's attention. He opened a trap, do trap door and I was on stage. Then he started laughing. I looked down and I still had a hard on and no trousers. <laughs> and then I woke up. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm going to talk through this for a little bit now. Let's get on to... Uh, so my point, uh, if I have a point, is that this, this thing about uh, taking notice of things that are all around you. And, and um, I'll try and now demonstrate, in a way, how that works. So we'll think of a mundane object, okay? Think of it. And how about 
that. Traffic cone, yeah? You do have those here, don't you? I know you do, because I passed them on the way down to the convention center. So, traffic cone, ordinary thing. But what I'm going to say is uh, we can learn something from this traffic cone. So if you're, if you're a person who uh, is into traffic, does a lot of driving, works for the motorway services, <laughs> you just think of traffic cones in this, this environment. Look at them, they're just, just freely grazing, um, doing their job by the side of a road. But Austin being quite a big student town, I believe, if you're a student here, you may think of traffic cones more in this context. Ho, ho, a jolly jape. Or even this context, as soon as he's been up on top of the Congress building there, put a traffic cone up there. So already our traffic cone is becoming more interesting. Now, what about if you are into the internet? and you love downloading content slightly illegally and then wanting to play it. It's okay, we're not, I'm not asking anybody to put their hand up and say they do it. But I'm saying this, you may think of this VLC media player. It's symbol, the traffic cone. Or maybe you, being at a music conference, are a massive Krautrock fan, and immediately you think, ah oh, yes, this was the first album of Kraftwerk. It has not been reissued. It's very rare to find. Um, so again, the traffic cone is taking us somewhere different. If you were at the Freeze Art Fair in London in October, you would have seen these artworks. They're real artworks that were uh, exhibited in Freeze. So what I'm saying there is what you see when you see, we're all looking at the same world like that ancient Hindu story about the seven blind men who were touching an elephant and you know depending on which bit of the elephant you touch you say it's a different creature the one who's got the trunk saying oh it's like a snake and the one who's around the back's going oh it's, it's like a donkey this little stringy tail they're not seeing the whole picture uh, depending on your how you live your life the experiences that you have the everyday experiences the mundane experiences will make you look at objects and make associations that are unique to you. And so that's what I'm saying. The good news is you already have a unique artistic sensibility. It's just a case of recognizing that and of think, not thinking it's going to come from somewhere else, realizing that your brain is actually constructing this, uh, this grid that you then see the world through. So you may end up... Um, I can, I can feel that it's an epiphany for a lot of us. And so <laughs> you may even end up, you know, getting a baseball cap with a, with a traffic cone on to like celebrate the fact that, that your eyes were open this very day. Um, <laughs> let's see where we're gonna go. So what I'm really saying is the extraordinary, if we want to create things that are extraordinary, we have to get into the extraordinary. Thank you. I, <laughs> I appreciate that. Basically, that's how it happens, I think. In my own personal experience, that's how I think it, it works. That We're all seeing the same world, but the stuff we do every day, the things we're into, things friends or brothers and sisters show us, the places we inhabit, make us reconstruct that world inside our own heads in different ways. And that web of influences and experiences is so complex and random that none of us does that reconstructing in exactly the same way. Uh, I guess, you know, just like none of us has exactly the same face as another person. Um, that's how it works. So um, that's one way of putting it, but I think it'd be nice to put it in a more poetic way, should we? So let's have a listen to, uh, this is the final piece of music and then we'll have some questions after this, but have a listen to this, a very short song by Van the Man, Van Morrison. Have a listen. Coney Island. Coming back from Dine Patrick, stopping off at St. John's Point. 
Heard all day bird watching and the crack was good. Stopped off at Strangford Lock early in the morning. Drove through Shigley, taking pictures and on to Kelly. Stopping for Sunday papers at the Lacal district. Just before Coney Island. On and on over the hill to our glass in the jam jar. Autumn sunshine, magnificent and all shining through. Stop off at our glass for a couple of jars of mussels and some potted herrings and in case we get famished before dinner. On and on uh, over the hill and the crack is good. Heading towards Coney Island. Now look at the side of your face. As the sunlight comes streaming through the window in the autumn sunshine. And all in all time, going to Coney Island, I'm thinking. Wouldn't it be great if it was like this all the time? Wouldn't it be great if it was like this all the time, he says? But it is like this all the time. Thank you. I uh, just have to say, uh, I'm sorry about the flying, but uh, that was a metaphor. <laughs> but, 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 you can't take off. You need a solid base to take off. You know, you can't fly unless you've got something to take off from. So think of this as a launch pad, okay. All right, well, I've, I've gone over a little bit, so we've only got a short time for questions, and Sean Combs is coming in here later, so I don't want to upset him. So uh, there's a microphone kind of halfway down the room. If you have any questions, I'll try and answer them in a reasonable manner. Um, I'm just wondering, you seem to have had this like endless stream of beautiful lovers in your life. When no. You're writing <laughs> when you're writing about them, are they... Amalgams, or are they actually individual women? Uh, sometimes specific, but that that is one thing. There's a line in that Wicker Man song that uh, where it says, "I went there with you once, except you were somebody else." And in a way, it's not like everything merges into one. Um, but a relationship, I suppose, is a, is another way in which we attempt to make contact with the other. You know, uh, so it, I'm not saying that. Um, people that you have relationships with are interchangeable, but it is about trying to access parts of yourself that you find in that person, I think. Um, but yeah, I remember everybody's name, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, can, you tell, can you tell us a little bit more about the history behind Common People? Oh. Well, uh, uh, Common People is, I suppose, Pult's most famous song um yeah that, that was pretty simple really i was at st martin's school of art in london uh, there was this thing called crossover i was studying film but uh, you had to kind of study another discipline for a couple of weeks and i decided to do sculpture so i went over there and i met a girl from greece having said that i remember everybody's name i can't remember hers <laughs> But then again, we, I, I never had a relationship with her, which is kind of the whole point of the song, you know. Uh, and we were all having a drink in a bar after college one night, and she said, you know, I really want to move to Hackney and, and live with the common people. Um, <laughs> and I just thought, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, that didn't work like that. I should have said that. I was just thinking that, you know what I mean? I probably was going, oh, yeah, I agree, yeah. Because I, I, I did kind of fancy it a bit. But, and that was kind of where the song comes from, I suppose. I was attracted to this girl, but I thought that this... I'm not saying like I'm Mr. Working Class, you know, I'm not here with me flat cap on and stuff like that, but having come from the kind of area and the kind of background that she was, uh, in a way, eulogizing or, or fantasizing about, I, I thought, you know, people who actually are born into that uh, background can't wait to get away from it, you know? It's like they have no choice. This girl had a choice. She came from a fairly well-to-do family, and so she was seeing it as a lifestyle option. But um, 
being poor isn't a lifestyle option, you know what I mean? It's, uh, it's, it's more an affliction, and it's, it's a weird area, you know, and that's where the, the, that kind of, uh, the way it troubled me and the way it kind of stuck in my mind uh, was where the song came from, because I met the girl 1989, and the song was written in 1995, so it often takes a long time for something to, to percolate through. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hello. Hello. Um, we once had a very bizarre day together in Venice where you carried Wellington boots around before the Venice Biennale, and that was fun. Yeah. Um, I, I want to know if you've already always written stuff for, that's not for songs, and if you have, how do you decide which is for which? Um, yeah, uh, I do write stuff, I, I, I make notes, but I'm very lazy, so things only get written up into something proper if, if it's a, a song or like in the case of that uh, piece for the time out, somebody asks you to write something. So the way it'll be is I'll, I'll have lots of notebooks with lots of uh, fragments in, things that I've seen or just ideas. And then when we as a band rehearse and stuff, we get vague ideas for songs. And I'll just be going, I saw we could you a on a shower cool. And, um, you know, keep look, searching for a melody, basically. Although that one wasn't very good. But, um, uh, and then if you get a melody, that I think is OK. So I'll go back and I'll listen to And I'll look through my book and I'll think, oh, yeah. She said that she was going to the bookshop uh, <laughs> uh, and try and get things that seem to fit with the with the the rhythm of what of the tune that you've come up with um so i'll kind of go through all the notebooks and then transfer them into another book that's like the greatest hits and some will kind of clump together into a subject and and that's the way the songs come together so i, I wish that i wrote more i wish that i had like you know uh, a safe with all these things that were finished and never did but i haven't really as you could also, you probably noticed in one of the things I read, uh, I recycle lines as well. So if a song doesn't make it, uh, and there's a couple of lines I like, then I'll just I'll just keep putting it in a song until it makes the grade. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, you're welcome. Thanks. Hi. Um, Hello. Do you have an, any sort of advice uh, regarding um, a? writing about a person or a subject or something like that that is just so daunting to you that you're afraid that you just don't have the words or you know, we won't be able to, to do that person or subject justice in, in terms of lyrics? Well, well, we discussed a little bit in the talk, you know, that I, I do think that you have to kind of, in a way, get over that thing. Human beings are all the same. Uh, the, the motivations are all the same. And, and that thing, I think we all do it. We all think, oh, that person's really got it sussed, you know, they, they're just gliding through life, nothing's touching them. And that person's probably looking at you thinking exactly the same thing. I think it, would be, it just seems to be a certain basic human insecurity that you think other people know what they're doing and you haven't got a clue. Uh, I don't think, you know, I think we're all flailing around <laughs> trying, to, trying to keep afloat, you know. But um, my things that I employ for writing about things, like for instance, if there's somebody you think is gonna come and like punch you if you write about them, right? <laughs> Not quite. Well, <laughs> I've had that. Um, um, so does the time lag? As I say, I, I'm, in a way, it's a blessing in disguise that I'm so slow. Uh, so if, if you write about somebody five years after the event, hopefully they'd live somewhere else or they've forgotten. Uh, or Change the name, just change the name. So, no, that's not about you. No. <laughs> You're not called Caroline, are you? Um, Thank you. Th that kind of thing, yeah. Here's something. Do you want uh, two options? Yeah. Um, something you have you ever had opportunities where you're too afraid to write up about something, or when's the last time you flew? <laughs> well, that's probably the last time I flew on stage. That's in Barcelona. Um, I get, you know, that's the thing, like a photograph freezes, uh, you know, half a second after that I was back on the ground. But I did fly for that instant, and that's the great thing, that in a way that's how songs work. You, you capture a moment, a, a moment that in the stream of life is gone maybe in the blink of an eye, but you capture that moment and, and make it kind of live forever in a way. 
That's one of it. What was the second, first bit? Oh, something that... What was the first bit of the question? Oh, too afraid to write about. Uh, I don't know if it's too afraid, but sometimes I just think there's, there, there is information that people just don't need to hear <laughs> because it's just too depressing. You know, I, I, so I, I don't say, I wouldn't say I particularly censor myself, but I just think, you know, that there are some things that are just, you know, certain revelations that are just too much of a downer, you know, and... Uh, so I, I tend to keep those to myself. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think with this will have to be the last question because we have, uh, there's a red light flashing here. Okay, this is I, kind I, of a two-part question. I don't know if that means something's going to explode. Oh, make it a really s small two-part question then. Okay, you mentioned uh, having some songs that never quite came to fruition. Yeah. I remember reading an interview with Candida between different class and This Is Hardcore stating you guys had almost a whole album's worth of material, but you thought it sounded like too much different like different class and wanted to go in a different direction. Is there a, a bunch of pulp material we might see from back in the day released at some point? Uh, no. And are you working oh. on anything new musically? All right. Uh, in answer to your first question, a lot of that stuff, the stuff that you're talking about there did come out. Uh, there were some deluxe editions of those first three Island albums, uh, His and Hers, Different Class and This Is Hardcore, which had a lot of material. And that, that stuff that you talk about uh, between Different Class and This Is Hardcore ended up on, on the extra disc of that. The only stuff that hasn't really come out is that the last album, the one we did with Scott Walker, took forever to do, and we did write a lot of songs, uh, and that's never been done as a deluxe thing. So the, there's quite a lot of songs from that kind of three-year period that never made it onto that record, but whether they'll ever surface. That song, After You, that we did at the start of last year, uh, that was a song from that period that we kind of revived. And me... I uh, am trying to be creative at the moment. I, uh, I don't know if some of you will know, I do a radio show in the UK, uh, and I've taken a, a year's sabbat sabbatical. I, can you take a sabbatical from something that happens on a Sunday? <laughs> um, anyway, I, I've taken a year off, and, um, and I'm, I'm trying to write stuff, but we can't talk about that. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here. We really have got to wrap it up now. Thank you.